Today on the Vander Says Podcast, we're going to talk about why multi-channel networks are terrible for you as a creator, YouTube releasing feature-length films for free, and a whole lot more. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 145 of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is what I says. Like always, there are timestamps in the show notes down below, so you can skip around to whatever you want to hear me discuss. And you can also find all the different versions of the podcast at bandrewsays.com, both audio and video. First thing we're going to be discussing today is YouTube releasing feature-length films for free. And the way that YouTube is actually being able to do this is by supporting the films via ads, which is exactly how just over-the-air television supports feature-length films. They pay for the rights with the advertisements. Now, you may automatically think, oh, free movies, these are all going to be terrible B-movies that nobody cares to see. But I went ahead and jumped into the area where you can see the films that are available, and there are some pretty great films in here. The films that I saw that seemed interesting to me are Legally Blonde, I think all of the Rocky films, which is really cool, The Terminator, that's right, The Terminator, Europa Report, Biodome, which is awesome, Hackers, and there's a whole lot more. When you get further down the list, there are some of those films that you would expect to see, movies that went straight to DVD that just don't seem very interesting. Now, all around, I do think that this is going to be a very good thing for YouTube because it may bring new people to the platform because who doesn't love free movies? I think everybody loves free movies. But I do think it is also a bit of a double-edged sword. What I mean by that is, yes, it does legitimize YouTube a little bit more and bring potential new viewers, but being now that there are free, really high production quality videos or movies, I should say, on the platform, people may opt to watch those because they'd much rather watch Arnold Schwarzenegger as a time-traveling robot trying to kill somebody than they would watch me talk about a microphone. So I think there there could be a little bit of a conflict of interest or maybe a kind of cannibalization of your viewers because now they have the option to watch something that people paid tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to create when you and I, we just spent 25 or 50 or or $1,000 to make our video. So we can tell what's going to have the higher production value and people may be drawn to that more than they will to the independent content creator. Now, the next story is also going to be YouTube related, and it is that Defy Media shut down. If you don't know what Defy Media is, it is some kind of, or it was, some kind of production company as well as multi-channel network. Some of the big channels that Defy Media had on their MCN and under their production company were both Smosh and Smosh Games. There are plenty of others, but I have never listened to them or watched them, and I'm not aware of them. But there were plenty of very large channels under the umbrella of Defy Media. Now, I do think it's important to understand how an MCN functions and how it's structured, mainly financially in this case. So when it comes to Defy Media and pretty much every MCN that I'm aware of, the way that it works is when you sign that contract, you are giving the right to that MCN to receive your payments from Google. So you no longer get paid on the 20th or 21st of the month. Your MCN receives that payment. Then that MCN is going to take their 10 to 30% share and then send you that payment one to two months later. So there is quite a significant delay added and you're also getting money taken out of your check. And the reason or the justification for them taking that percentage is they offer you services. Cool. Now, the thing that's really shocking about how Defy Media conducted themselves is they just came out of the blue and said, we're filing for bankruptcy and apparently didn't have any kind of conversation with the channels that they manage or the people that were employed by them. So nobody knew that they were declaring bankruptcy. They found out about it in the news, which is just incredibly shady behavior. Now, because the creator's AdSense money was in Defy's bank account and they declared bankruptcy, 
the bank used that money that was in Defy Media's bank account to pay their debts. What that means is the creators lost one to two to three months of their AdSense revenue. That's what's really shady about how Defy Media did this. It seems that they made sure not to disclose that they were going to declare bankruptcy so creators wouldn't contact them saying, hey, we need our money now. We need it because if you declare bankruptcy, we're not going to get it. Now, I have been very vocal about my distaste for multi-channel networks because I don't think that they offer much value or services. They don't make it easy to contact them and they just take a percentage of your income. Now, based on a number of emails that I have personally received asking to join somebody's MCN and the videos that I have seen of people trashing their MCN, what I've garnered is that the entire business of running a multi-channel network is just a numbers game, meaning that they will send out hundreds, if not thousands of emails to as many creators that are monetized as possible and hoping that they get a hundred or a thousand new creators to sign up with them. Now, the reason that I think they do that is if you look at a small channel that's earning $100 a month or $300 or $500 a month from their AdSense, you may not think, oh, 10% of that, that's not that much money. But when you take into account that they may have 100 or 1,000 or 5,000 channels on their MCN, that really starts to add up. And I did a little bit of math here. Let's just assume that an MCN is taking 10% of your revenue. Now, let's also assume that that MCN has 3,000 creators who make $100 a month, or let's say 1,000 creators who make $300 a month. Now, it really isn't that far-fetched for an MCN to have 1,000 creators signed to them, each earning $300 a month. And that may not seem like a lot of money up front, but when you do a very easy calculation of just multiplication, that comes to $300,000 every single month in total AdSense revenue. Now, of course, they're not getting the full amount there, but they are getting between 10 and 30%. Let's just go on the low end and say they're only getting 10%. That's $30,000 a month by not really offering much in terms of services. And whenever you may have an issue, Sure, you can try and contact them, but they can ignore you because they have a thousand other creators to take care of, and that's really difficult. Oh, we have so many creators, we can't really answer all your emails, but also, you're only making them $100 or $300, or I guess it would be more like $10 or $30. That's not that much money, so why would we give you five hours a month? We wouldn't. That's only $30. Screw you. You don't matter to us. Go ahead and leave. Oh, wait, you can't. We signed you to a legally binding contract for two years. Now, when I look at this, it doesn't seem like these MCNs exist to assist creators in making good content. It is all about getting as many creators as they can to get an insane amount of money by offering both false hope and false promises. Now, the reason that I am saying that is I've received a lot of emails from NCNs And I will include a screenshot in the video right here from one that I received in 2016 where they say we can provide a CPM of $5 to $35 and we'll take 30% of your ad revenue. So in this case, it's even worse than the 10% that I was saying before. They're taking 30% of all of my ad revenue, including AdSense, and they're promising a $35 CPM. I have never once in my life heard of a YouTuber getting a $35 CPM. That is nothing but false promises. Maybe they were able to work out one deal where they got somebody $35 for doing a full branded video. But you are not going to get a $35 CPM for a general advertisement. That is just false advertising and shady as hell. Now I'll end this news story by just putting out a disclaimer. You should always be skeptical of anybody who is trying to get in between you and your money because that will always exist. Somebody will always want to find a way to manipulate you and tie you into a legally binding contract to make sure that you are just a money-making machine for them when they don't really have to do diddly squat for you. 
You need to ask yourself, what is the real benefit of joining these MCNs? Oh, you get access to an audio library. Oh, you get TubeBuddy. Cool. They'll go ahead and help you collaborate with people. I have never heard of that actually working out or an MCN following through with that. I can't tell you the number of emails I've received of MCN saying, we'll give you access to our audio library. You know what that tells me? Those MCNs did not watch my content or they don't understand what's best for it because I review microphones. You cannot have an underlying bed of music in a microphone review because people need to hear what the microphone sounds like. So either you are just ignoring what the content actually is, you don't know what's best for my channel, or you're just sending out emails to as many creators as possible, showing me that you don't really give a crap about creators. You just view them as a way to earn money. So ask yourself, what is the actual benefit here? And do you want to be tied to this company, this MCN, for one to two years? And if you want to leave them, you have to get a lawyer. Yeah, think of it that way, actually. Would you be willing to hand over hundreds or thousands of dollars to some random person who sends you an email without ever having met them? And not only that, you're legally binding yourself to them, so if you want to separate from them, you gotta get a lawyer involved. That seems like a terrible, terrible idea. So I'm just gonna end it there. Be careful, think about, am I getting any actual value out of this? And also think, what are they getting out of this? Okay, well, <laughs> that was a bit of a diatribe and a rant, and I apologize, but I am very passionate about these MCNs and them trying to take advantage of new creators who just get excited that they get offered this new deal. And I don't think everybody should jump on board right away. Let's get to something a little bit lighter, and it is new products announced from Rode. So Rode dropped an announcement today for a new device, and it is called the Rodecaster. This thing is going to be a mixer as well as a portable recorder. It has four XLR inputs, four quarter inch headphone outputs, amazing, a 3.5 millimeter TRRS input, as well as a Bluetooth connection. So you can connect it to your phone, which it then automatically provides a mix minus two. How insane is that? It's also got a soundboard so you can put your jingles or your bumpers or your podcast theme music on there and play it directly off the device. It's got class A preamps, Aphex processing like the Oral Exciter and Big Bottom. It's also got compression, limiting, DSing, and noise gating. You can record to an SD card, but it can also function as a USB audio interface. Now, as far as the release date, it is slated for mid-December, and we also don't know what the official pricing is gonna be. So let me go ahead and take a little bit of a guess here and try to calculate what it's gonna cost or my guess on what it's going to cost. So let's look at the AI one from Rode, which is their USB audio interface. 130 bucks for that thing for a single channel USB audio interface. And I'm gonna guess that this Rodecaster is going to be similar preamps, maybe a bit more gain. So if you just take into account those preamps, we could probably say that'll be 400 to $500. Then you gotta add in the cost for the headphone amps, the licensing for the Aphex processing, all the other processing, the sound boards, the SD card recording, the A to D converters, all of that stuff, so we can add another $100 to $200. And when you look at something similar like the L12, it's $600 for that device. So I am going to guess that around $599 or $699 is what we'll see for this Rodecaster, but that is pure speculation. I don't know. I hope it's lower, but I think $599 is probably what we're gonna see. Now in this video, they had a release video, there was a little bit of an Easter egg in there. On the screen here for the YouTube video, this is what we saw. A new microphone from Rode, and it certainly looks like some kind of broadcast dynamic microphone. There's been no announcement of this, but it looks fascinating, and I want it, I want it, I want it. I cannot wait for this thing. This is so exciting for this new portable audio recorder and a new broadcast dynamic microphone. I love those things. This is so cool. 
Next, we got some really good news for podcasters, and it would be that podcasts are coming to Pandora. First up, if you don't know, what is Pandora? It's apparently the largest music streaming service in the U.S. with 76 million listeners. So not only are they bringing a huge potential audience, but they're also bringing something else to podcasting, and that is called the Podcast Genome Project. What they define this as is a cataloging system and discovery algorithm that uses a combination of technology and human curation to deliver personalized content recommendations. It will also assess content on 1,500 attributes spanning from MPAA ratings timely and evergreen topics, production style, content type, host profile, etc. Now, I do want to point out that this is not going to be available for all podcasters immediately. It is a very select group of content providers that Pandora partnered with, ranging from people like Gimlet to the Ramsey Network to Libsyn to Max Fun to NPR to WNYC Studios and a whole bunch of others. Now, like I said with Spotify, you should not see this announcement and expect your listenership to grow 7,000% over the next year, because will that happen? Probably not. If anything, this is just another place that your podcast can find your next potential listener. So it's exposing your podcast to a larger potential audience. Now, I'm going to take a controversial stand here and say that I think it's smart that Pandora is not letting all podcasts in immediately. But why do I say that? It's because there are a lot of very poorly produced podcasts out there. And if someone decided, I want to check out what this whole podcasting thing is, I've heard a lot of rave about it. Let's see what it's about. Then they jump in and hear Joe Bob and Billy Jean's podcast about finance, but the first 10 minutes is just them saying, is this recording? Scratching the microphone, popping open beers, giggling at inside jokes that nobody gets with a blue Yeti in the middle of a room with no audio treatment. That podcast may have turned that potential listener away from all podcasts because they assume that all podcasts are going to be that poorly produced, that poorly formatted, and that poorly edited, if there is any editing in this fictional finance podcast. So to summarize, I think at launch, it is a great idea to strictly curate the content that's available to ensure that the potential new listeners for podcasts are getting a very, very good first impression. And that will lead to them wanting to dive a little bit deeper and find a podcast for that niche that they thought only they loved. Now let's jump back to Rode and talk about what I have been testing, and you have been listening to it this entire time. I am speaking into the Rode NTG3. Full disclosure, this was sent to me by Rode so I could review it on the podcastage channel, but like I do with all higher-end microphones, gotta run it on the podcast, put it through its paces, and see how I like it with processing over time with different approaches to using it. Now my first thoughts... It's definitely got a lot more bottom end than something like the MKH416. That's the very first thing I noticed when switching between them. With the MKH416, you could get right on top of the microphone and it wouldn't sound boomy. It wouldn't be overpowered by the low end because the top end is very accentuated on the MKH416. With this one, it is a more neutral sounding microphone when you're a bit farther away. But when you get right on top of the microphone, you get a huge, huge bottom end. That's gonna be good for some people doing voiceover, less so for others. But the real benefit for that is you can back off the microphone and it still maintains that lower body. For instance, right here, I'm maybe eight inches off of the microphone and it doesn't really sound thin. It still has a lot of body in the low end. So I guess it does have a very different tone from the MKH416 but it's still pretty interesting. I think it's really nice sounding and it does a lot more work for us with puny voices. <laughs> I know Josh C. Liston from the On The Bubble podcast says he uses this microphone because it does a little bit more heavy lifting on his voice and I can confirm it does a lot more heavy lifting on my voice and makes me sound a little bit manlier, which I definitely need. Now let's jump to what you had to say. And the first comment comes from Car Ramrod. Say Car Ramrod! Do you feel like deplatforming is a modern day book burning? 
Car Ramrod. That is a very interesting comparison, but I don't know if I have an actual answer for you. The reason I say that is I don't know much about the actual book burnings. The only thing that I know about book burnings is from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where Indiana walks up to Hitler and gets his grail journal signed. So unless all book burnings have Hitler there and you can get your grail journal signed by him, I know nothing about book burnings. I don't know if it required all books to be removed from circulation or if it's like people burning records where they go out and buy a bunch of records giving the artists a bunch of money in the process and then burning them. I don't know what is actually behind the historical book burnings. I think it may not be similar because I'm guessing that it was government guided book burnings and the books were taken out of circulation, making it impossible to get access to them. But in this case, it's more companies just removing content that they think will get them into hot water, where people will make statements saying, oh, YouTube's backing white supremacists. Oh, YouTube is backing the Republicans. YouTube is backing Antifa. YouTube doesn't want to get into that position, so it's not government guided. So I think that's a very big distinction between historical book burnings and deplatforming. But I could be completely wrong, and that's a very good question that I would love to hear from people in the comments about. Do you think that the current deplatforming is similar to historical book burnings, or do you think it's completely different? Love to hear from me in the comments down below. Next comment comes from DSD. He says, good artwork and music update. The banning thing is pretty scary. People put a ton of effort into their career and it can be deleted in an instant. DSD, that is a very good point and something that I agree with 100%. When you host all of your content or your entire business on a third party platform, your entire business is reliant on that third party and they can turn you off like that. If you break their terms of service, you're gone. Or they can change their terms of service and say you've been violating it and you're gone. So there is something very, very dangerous about hosting your entire career on third-party platforms. Additionally, that's why I think it's so important to have a presence in multiple places and also have your own domain that you personally own. Yes, you are still likely relying on third parties for your domain and your hosting. However, that currently seems much less likely to get taken away from you. The hosts and the servers and the domain registrars haven't been attacked the same as the social media platforms. But regardless, if your YouTube channel gets deleted or your Twitter gets taken away, if you have had that domain and you have pushed it out there and people are aware of it, they will always have a place to go if they want to find out, oh, what's Bandrew up to? Okay, I'll go ahead and check out bandrewsays.com or I'll go ahead and check out bandrewscott.com. There's always a place for them to find you now if those platforms get taken away from you. So I agree 100% very dangerous to host your entire career on third-party platforms. And the last comment comes from Crazy Wabbit. He says, love your podcast and what you do. I do disagree with this Shikaro cat. Yes, you are correct. This was a computer game. Here are my concerns. One, this type of behavior has been carried out on people, especially African-Americans, i.e. James Byrd Jr. Two, we live in a day when all it takes is someone to say something and someone else goes out and shoots and kills in PA. It is not a far stretch for someone to see this on YouTube, see someone in real life, you can do the math. Three, although this is a game, this has real life implications, see number two, and I found nothing to laugh at. Four, YouTube did the right thing to ban and should have removed the channel. The choice is simple, don't do this. Yes, the game designers bear some blame, but this does not excuse the content creator nor followers from potentially acting out. The same kind of logic could be used for a Logan Paul supporter. The person committing suicide was at fault, not Logan for filming it. There has to be a line drawn at decency, common sense, and at the minimum, a sense of right and wrong. I guess if one has never been oppressed or lived in fear, it is possible for someone to understand and be more focused on freedom of speech. Crazy Wabbit, I appreciate very much your comment and I apologize ahead of time. I wrote a lot in response to you and I am going to read through it. If anybody watching or listening is not interested in a very long rebuttal to this comment, 
check the timestamps and the show notes and he can skip past it. But in response to number one, I did not know who James Bird was, but I looked it up and I agree it is terrible that anyone would do that. So I don't think it's necessary for me to say this. I think it's ridiculous that I have to say it, but I will. Racism and murder are both terrible, terrible things that I do not condone, and I denounce anybody who does that. I can't believe that I have to say that in modern times, but I guess I do. I want to make that clear. I think racism is reprehensible behavior. I, I'm making jokes, kind of, because I am very uncomfortable talking about this. Don't think that it's me saying that, oh, I think this is a joking matter. I am just very uncomfortable talking about this. So racism is reprehensible. Murder also reprehensible. Don't condone either of them. On your second point, I do agree that there are a lot of crazy people out there in this world who will do stupid and violent things. There is absolutely no denying that. However, I don't think that anyone would see this Shiraco or Shikaro video and think, oh, I didn't know that was okay. Now let me go ahead and go find a woman and lasso her and feed her to a crocodile. I don't think anybody in the right mind would view that and think, oh, well, now I have a free pass to do that. Now, I could be wrong in that statement because that could be the snapping point for someone who is already unhinged. Now, I briefly touched on this a couple of months ago when I was talking about Alex Jones being blamed for violent behavior. And the thing that I was talking about there is me saying people who like pineapple on their pizza are monsters. Some crazy person could look at that and think of that as justification for going out and attacking people who like pineapple on their pizza. So the question that's raised there is, should content creators be held liable for crazy people either misinterpreting the meaning of their work or using their work as justification for their crazy actions. In regards to your third point, that is completely fair that you found nothing funny about it. I often find myself laughing at disgusting things, mainly because I am so uncomfortable all the time. It gives me a little bit of levity over that situation, a little bit more control over situations, but I'm not making excuses for myself. But also, I do agree with your point completely that everybody's actions online do have real-world implications and they will cause real-world effect. Now, in response to your fourth point, as I said last week, I think that the channel should not have been taken down, but it should have been age-restricted, which is what I believe YouTube's final conclusion was. Now, I personally almost always lean towards free speech as long as it is not directly calling for violence, and I view this video as silly or dumb or awful as it is, I view it as freedom of speech. Now, to pose a question back to you, if YouTube were to ban this guy for uploading a video that's violent like this, how can almost any Grand Theft Audio Let's Play be allowed on the platform? Could it not be argued that those types of videos and those Let's Plays are normalizing criminal behavior and influencing the youths to think criminal activity is okay? Going even further, what about a song from NWA like Fuck the Police? Or what about a movie like American History X? Both of those are very violent pieces of art. But my stance is almost all art has a reason and a purpose for existing, regardless of how uncomfortable it can possibly make us. Now, with all of that being said, I agree 100% with your conclusion that everybody uploading to the internet should expect everything that they upload to be viewed by their parents, their significant other, or their employers. So if you would not want any of those groups of people to see what you're uploading, don't upload it. Now, when it comes to your comparison about blaming the game developers and Logan Paul, let me give some clarification on what I said last week. When I said if anyone should be at fault, it's the game developers, that was me being a little bit facetious because I think that would be an insane outcome, mainly because then every single game developer would have to be at fault for violent videos being uploaded to the internet. Now, as far as the Jake Paul thing, I don't necessarily agree with your comparison with Logan Paul, I think I said Jake Paul earlier, Logan Paul and the Suicide Forest. I don't believe that the Scirocco clip was intending to use someone's mental illness to manipulate their audience and get millions of views under the guise of being a positive influence, which is what I think 
what is it, Logan Paul was doing. And that's one of the main problems that I had with your argument. I don't agree with that comparison. But as far as Logan Paul, his audience skews very, very young. And I don't think that a child should be exposed to images of a dead person at an early age. Or if they are exposed to death or anything along those lines, it should be through a conversation with their parent or a counselor or if they're religious with a pastor, somebody who is much more fit to have that discussion with a child. Not some dopey YouTuber who hasn't done the research about mental health or death or coping strategies, which is why I don't like talking about this stuff because I am not qualified to talk about it. I am not a counselor. I am not a therapist. And I don't want to put out information that could be potentially harmful. But having said that I don't think Jake Paul's video was suitable for his young audience, I also don't think that Chiraco's type of content is suitable for a young audience, which is why it should be age restricted. Now, going even further into your comment, I do agree that to some extent, there should be some decency and some sense of what's right and wrong 100%. But the issue there is who decides what's right and what's wrong. Is it going to be you? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be Google or Facebook? Or is it going to be the governments? And if it is the governments, which governments are going to make that distinction? Because different governments have a very different opinion of what's right and what's wrong and what's decent. Now, as I said in my series of rants in last week's episode, I just don't envy the position that these companies have put themselves in. And I also don't have the answers for what should be allowable and what should be unallowable. These companies will inevitably be stepping on some kind of freedom of speech, even if it's not government-sanctioned limiting of freedom of speech. Now, I guess I'll end my response by saying, yeah, you're right. I have never been oppressed the same that other people have because I am a straight white male. But I do live in a constant state of fear. Now, it's arguable if that fear is justified or if it's not. I think it's justified, but others might say, no, you're just being paranoid. The entire point of what I was saying in last week's episode is I simply don't think that every video game where someone commits an act of violence should lead to that creator uploading the video being banned. And lastly, as I mentioned in my response to DSD, using another person's platform is insanely risky. We could talk about this all we want and what Google says goes because it is their platform. They could say no more violent video games allowed we're only going to allow Minecraft and every single Call of Duty game, every single Call of Duty Let's Play, every single Red Dead Redemption Let's Play, gone in an instant, and we would have no recourse to fight back. Now, I know that my response has already been insanely long, probably the longest one I've done so far, but I wanted to send a sincere thank you to you because a lot of people in the YouTube comments would just come out and say, you're a dopey idiot, I hate you, you should die. Rather, you decided to leave a very well thought out and very civil comment, and I appreciate that so much, and that's why I spent so much time on this, because you did raise a lot of very good points. We may still disagree on plenty of them, but I think we kept it civil, and I think that's something a lot of people in the YouTube comments can learn. So thank you very much, Crazy Wabbit. I appreciate you so, so much. I hope we can still be friends. You're awesome. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the podcast, the Ask Bandrew segment. All right. So just a reminder, if y'all got any questions, you can send them to askbandrew at gmail.com and I will most likely answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. First email comes from Logan Noggle the host of the Paper Robots podcast. He says, Hello, Bandrew. I love the conspiracy corner and you playing up your fear of all things privacy. So, if it was possible, would you remove your address off the record and live solely through internet a la prime delivery boxes, PO boxes, Google Fiber, and drones? Or scrub your identity from the net and go dark like Ron Swanson, provided you would return into town, hop on a library computer, and upload your content. Also, Last year, we saw the death of 3D TVs, curved TVs, and headphone jacks. But more, more VR slash AR. 
Do you think 2018 tech fads will die and which are continuing to rise? One more question. With the death of net neutrality and rise in data caps and throttling, do you foresee us as a society going back to paid internet cafes like in the early days of the internet? Thoughts? Thanks for reading. Keep up all the fun content. Logan Doggle. My doggle. Thank you very much for the email. I appreciate you. If anybody listening to this or watching this is interested in comic book creation, go check out the Paper Robots podcast. Awesome, awesome content. Thepaperrobots.com. So would I live completely off the grid? You better believe I would. That's the dream. Living completely off the grid. I have actually been researching how to anonymously purchase a home And it seems like the best way to do so would be to put the home in a trust or purchase it through an anonymous LLC, which is available in a couple of different states. Now, I doubt I would ever go to the extent of having stuff delivered to an Amazon Prime locker, but I definitely would have it delivered to a P.O. box. But going back to the purchasing of a house anonymously, once you do that, you never, ever, ever want to give that address to anybody because the moment you do, they'll add it to their contact book. And then what happens when they add their contact book to Facebook? All that work of purchasing that home anonymously, going through the hoops of getting a an anonymous LLC or a trust. It's all out the window because somebody thought, I'm going to go ahead and upload my contacts to Facebook. Or if you were to order from Amazon and deliver to that address, you better believe that that is going to get out there. So it's all about never associating your name with that anonymous address. So absolutely, I would live off the grid if I could. That is the dream. As far as scrubbing my identity and going dark like Ron Swanson, to some extent, I would. I would love that. But being that I do make YouTube content, I don't think I could or would be able to do that 100%. I do hate the level of tracking or my conspiratorial brain would call it surveillance. But I believe that in order to be a really successful content creator, you do need to have personality online. So I couldn't really completely remove myself. Also, I just rely a bit too much on the internet for both entertainment, research, and almost everything else. So I couldn't go completely off the grid or completely wipe my identity from the internet like Ron Swanson. Now, as far as what tech fads will die, I think VR is a technology that won't grow much further. And I don't think it will die, but I think it will remain a somewhat niche technology because it allows you to do one thing and one thing alone. And right now it is mainly just gaming. But on the other hand, I think AR is a technology that we'll see grow quite significantly in the coming years because currently we haven't really seen a very usable version of AR, especially a wearable that you would wear as glasses come out. But when that does come out, if it does come out, that would be groundbreaking because you could have a constant stream of information put in front of your eyes that is very useful and makes your life much easier. And I think that will be a fad or a a technology that grows in the future if we get a useful implementation of it. Some fads that I do wish would die, I guess Fortnite and TikTok, hopefully. (laughs) And lastly, do I think net neutrality and throttling will lead to the return of internet cafes? I don't think that we're going to see a return of internet cafes where you go in and pay by the hour. And the reason that I say that is while currently the physical ISPs that run a wire to your home seem to be increasing prices and introducing data caps and throttling you, it seems like mobile ISPs are in a race to the bottom. For instance, this last week, I think it was, I saw T-Mobile and Verizon both release prepaid unlimited data plans, which are $50 and $65 respectively, if I'm remembering correctly. Now, are those truly unlimited data plans? No, none of them really are. They will always start throttling you once you hit a certain data amount. But I think if the physical cable actually running to your house providing you internet continues to get more expensive, people will just abandon ship and start using their mobile ISPs for everything. Awesome, awesome questions, Logan. Thank you very much. Appreciate you.
Next email comes from Ben Brown. He says, hey, Bandrew, last week I endured a disastrous Windows 10 update that as a ripple effect cost me all of my installed hardware, including all of my audio production programs, plugins, and painstakingly custom made effects chains for voiceover and so on. Gone. I always externally back up important files, such as project files, audio interviews, narration, and musical elements for the podcast I produce. But I've learned a lesson in needing to externally duplicate my valued software as well, like my DAW. This sounds like a no-brainer, but typically I'm going to one hard drive for the operation of my DAW and plugins, and my myopic thinking was that I should just store that stuff on my computer's internal hard drive and be just fine. Should I have backed up that data to avoid losses? Absolutely. But I was too comfortable and unwittingly stupid. Thankfully, I didn't lose any of my important media files. My questions. Have you ever had to rebuild your soft audio infrastructure from scratch? For instance, I've been reassembling plugins and settings from the ground up to get back to my preferred podcast voice quality, which is pretty tedious. What precautions do you take to avoid loss of data and programs should a catastrophe strike? Long-time listener, first-time ask Bandrewer. Also, give me your current top three to sentence songs. Thanks, and sorry if I've already worn out my welcome with all this typing. Ben, the Municipal Equation Podcast, and the Tourette's Podcast. Ben, thank you very much for the questions. I very much appreciate you. And everybody watching and listening to this should check out Ben's podcast. They're awesome. I love the Tourette's Podcast and what he's doing to destigmatize Tourette's. It's incredible. Appreciate you so much, Ben. Let's get to these questions. Have I had to rebuild my soft audio infrastructure from scratch? First off, I'm going to say that sucks that you lost everything. That is such a pain in the butt. I have been there in the past, and I am very sorry to hear that. But I'm going to say this. I know I am an outlier. I know I am a weirdo. I know I am a freak. I rebuild my software audio infrastructure every single time I get a new device. I never back up a device from a backup. If anything, I keep backups to ensure that if my computer does crash, I have some of those important files. But I never restore a computer to the state that it was right before a backup or right before a failure. I never do that. This allows me to get rid of all the clutter that I thought that I needed but never really did. Then when I do realize I need a piece of software or a plugin, then I'll go download it and install it on the new computer. Now, admittedly, I do store some of my Final Cut Pro plugins and also fonts on multiple external hard drives. And that's because finding and downloading some Final Cut plugins, as well as hundreds, if not thousands of special fonts, is an absolute nightmare. So that is much more time consuming than having to download Logic Pro 10 and then download the Universal Audio Installer. That is much more painful than having to do the latter, which is just downloading two things and saying, install all of the stuff that I own. (laughs) So I I store the really monotonous stuff on external hard drives for that specific case. So technically, I do rebuild my software every single time I get a new device, which is embarrassingly more often than I should have new devices. Now, as far as what precautions I take to avoid loss of data and programs should catastrophe strike, to avoid data loss, I just store my media files on external SSDs. As much as I know I should, I just don't do full computer backups as much anymore because I used to do it And I never referred back to those files except for maybe once or twice where I needed something that was on the backup. But I very rarely do that, and I know I should. So I just store my media files on external SSDs so I can easily transfer them between computers if I need to. And I really should get back into uh, actually backing up my computers, even though I may not refer back to them, just for security's sake. Oof, you've made me paranoid, Ben. I don't need any more paranoia. Okay, top three Descendant songs. I will say I'm an Everything Sucks kind of man. That's the album that I first discovered them from, and I listened to that album for seemingly years. It's too difficult to to just pick three. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my favorite song off of every one of their albums. Off of Milo Goes to College, we got Suburban Home. Great song. From I Don't Want to Grow Up, Good Good Things. 
for Enjoy, which is by far their weirdest, weirdest album and has a lot of farting. I don't I didn't think you could put that much farts on an album, but I'm going to say get the time for their album. All I will say clean sheets, which is just a very catchy song or van because that is just technical and insane. It doesn't sound like the same band for everything sucks when I get old for cool to be you. I'm going to go with cool to be you or one more day. And I choose that second one because it's such a sad song about Bill and his father's relationship. And it's, oh God, it's just heartbreaking. And then lastly, for hypercaffeum spasinate, I'm going to say on paper, because that's something that a lot of us nerdier types have thought and felt. I'm going to share one line with you that's far too relatable. I'm not so easy on the eye. It's been said that my face can make an onion cry. I mean no harm, but I've got the charm of a murdering serial raper. That's some darkness, but it's very relatable. It's very relatable. Now, the thing that I love about the Descendants, I'll end my response with this. The thing I love about them is as they get older, their songs and lyrics progress to match their age. You don't typically see that with bands. They just stay making the same types of songs. But Descendants, they have songs about having high cholesterol or needing testosterone replacement. They have stuff that as they grow older, their songs are growing older with themselves and with their audience, and it makes it so much easier to still relate to that band and the fact that their singer worked at DuPont as a chemical engineer for, for decades. It's crazy. Okay, Ben, thank you very much. I appreciate the email, and thank you for the Descendants comment. I appreciate you. And the last email comes from Bonnie. She says, I was thinking of starting a podcast for women over 50. My question is, should I use my business name, Facebook and website, or should I set up a completely different online profile for the podcast? I am a massage therapist, but I don't want to limit my podcast to massage only topics. It's boring and life is so much more than work. What would be the best way to go? I already have a blog on my website and a Facebook page. And do you think women over 50 listen to podcasts? Is that not enough of a niche? Thanks, Bonnie. Bonnie, thank you very much for the email. Very, very good question. The naming scheme for your podcast is always insanely difficult because that's one of the first impressions that people will have of your podcast. So I would start by asking, is the business name only associated with massage? And also, does your business have a huge following on social media already? If you don't want to discuss only massage and your business has a name like massage for you, then it may not be fitting to launch a podcast there. If your business does have a huge following, you're a step up on a lot of podcasters, but you still don't have to go with the business name as your podcast. You would still be able to leverage the following that you have regardless of what you name your podcast. You'll just need to strategically word how you advertise your podcast to your existing clients. I imagine that there are plenty of adjacent topics that people who get massages would be interested in and you can cover all of those and market those specific topic podcasts to your massage clients. But in your email, you did say that massage therapy is kind of boring. And if you think that, definitely do not start a podcast on that topic. If you already find it boring to talk about, you will get burned out so, so quickly if you start talking about it even more and start podcasting. The first hiccup you, you come across where you say, I don't want to record today, you will say, okay, I'm not going to record today because I'm so bored of massage therapy. If you're bored of the topic before you start the podcast, do not start a podcast on that topic. So what I would personally do here is use a name that's descriptive of what your podcast is going to cover. The Blanket Podcast. Blankets are good for health. I don't know what your podcast is going to cover, but make the name of your podcast descriptive. Then, when you discuss stuff that is adjacent to your massage clients or that your massage clients would be interested in, then share that across your business accounts to your existing clients. Now, as far as your question about 50-year-old women listening to podcasts, I do not know. I don't see many 50-year-old women in my podcast statistics because my podcast is just not interesting to the majority of 50-year-old women. 
But I imagine that there are plenty of 50 year old women or 50 plus year old women who do listen to podcasts. But more importantly, if they don't listen to podcasts right now, it could just be because there isn't a podcast that they find interesting. Your podcast could be that entry point for the 50 plus year old woman audience. You could be that podcast for them where they said, oh, wow, I just listened to the Bander Says podcast and I think podcasts suck because they are clearly not made for me. But then they come across Bonnie's podcast and they say, oh my God, this podcast was made specifically for me. It talks about stuff that I am going through and things that I find interesting. So even if the market doesn't currently exist, you could start that market. I guarantee you that there are 50-year-old women who are interested in podcasts or would be interested in podcasts if they see value in it and if people are making content that's specifically for them. That's what I got for you. Bonnie, I hope that helps. Thank you so much for the email and best of luck with the podcast. And that is going to wrap up today. Thank you all so much for watching, for listening. I appreciate you guys so much. Again, bandrewsays.com for different versions of the podcast. You can check out everything else that I am working on on bandrewscott.com. You can leave me a note on Twitter at bandrewsays, and I will see you all next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Vandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.